Here we go. Closing arguments. Amy Mullis will never get to see her kids graduate from high school. She won't be there when they go off to college, and she won't be there when they get married, because her life ended when she was brutally and viciously attacked with a corn rake on November 10th, 2018. Amy Mullis didn't stand a chance. She was unarmed and unaware that she was about to be ambushed by the very man that took a vow to love and honor her, the defendant. Amy Mullis would still be alive today if it weren't for the actions of her husband. She started that day like any other day, working on a puzzle, making breakfast for her family, and doing some chores on the farm. She didn't know that was the day that the defendant was going to seize his opportunity. He was going to attack her in the back with a corn rake and try to make it look like an accident. Amy Mullis is not here to tell her story. The defendant made sure of that when he turned Amy from a beautiful and vibrant 39-year-old woman into this, a state medical examiner number. When you go back to the jury room, you have three tools to aid you in your deliberation. The first is the facts. That's the evidence and the testimony that came from this witness stand. The second tool to aid in your deliberation is the law. And Judge Bitter just started reading a lot of the law to you, and he's going to read a little bit more to you when we're done here. And I'm also going to go over some of it. And the third tool that you get to take back there with you is your common sense your collective common sense that comes from your everyday life experiences. Ask yourself what makes sense. You'll then see when you use your common sense and apply it to the law and the facts that the only verdict supported by both the law and the evidence is that the defendant is guilty of first degree murder. Now as jurors, you have a duty you all got sworn in on either Monday afternoon or Tuesday, and you all took an oath. And you have a duty, your sole duty, is to find the truth and do justice. And the state has the burden of proof, as the judge just read to you, and we talked about in jury selection. And we only have to prove the elements of the crime charged. The state must prove all of the following elements of murder in the first degree. First, on or about the 10th day of November 2018, the defendant committed an act upon Amy Mullis. Second, Amy Mullis died as a result of the act by the defendant. Third, the defendant acted with malice aforethought. And fourth, the defendant acted willfully, deliberately, premeditatedly, and with specific intent to kill Amy Mullis. So let's talk about the first proposition. On or about the 10th day of November 2018, the defendant committed an act upon Amy Mullis. The act is the striking of the corn, taking this corn rake and striking Amy Mullis with it. There is absolutely no controverted testimony that Amy Mullis was struck with this corn rake on November 10th, 2018. We know Amy was struck at least two or three times. We know she had other injuries on the front of her body, and that corn, rail, corn rake excuse me, was impaled in her back. We know that's the act. And how do we know the defendant committed the act? Like I said to you before, one of the most important things is the facts and the evidence that came from this witness stand. We know that back in November 2018, Amy is scared of the defendant. She is planning on leaving the defendant. She is the only, I'm sorry, he is the only person who has the motive to kill Amy. And we know that, we know he has motive because of the affair that Amy is having. The defendant can come up here and tell you 
that he thought that affair was over. He didn't care. It was everything was hunky-dory. You know he's not telling you the truth. You are the judges. You are to determine the credibility of the witness. You are to look at the, the demeanor and the credibility of the witnesses when they testify. Look at that in light of all the other evidence and ask yourself if that makes sense. Amy is telling all of her friends and family how she's afraid of the defendant. She's afraid that if he finds out she's having an affair, he's going to kill her or make her disappear. You heard from the defendant's own mouth and you've heard from everybody else in this case, nobody else had the motive to kill Amy. The defendant knew about that affair, and we know the defendant didn't want Amy to get half of his farm. And we know that from two people, because he told Eileen Fuller that, and he told Terry Stainer that. He told them, well, I can't let her take half of my farm. He wasn't going to let Amy get half of his farm or try to take away his kids from him. The defendant is the only one that had the opportunity to do this. He waits until Amy has this procedure, this very simple procedure, so that he can use that as an excuse. Don't let him fool you. What about the text that day? Carrie Callan's text to, I'm sorry, Carrie Callan texts Amy and asks, how are things going? I'm worried about you because she hasn't heard from her in a few days or a couple weeks actually. And she writes back, okay, Things are kind of tense around here. I don't know what's going to happen. That's at 8 in the morning. We know at 10.14 in the morning, Amy is then emailing Jerry Frazier saying she doesn't really want to, but she's going to go out and do some chores on the barn. And then at noon, at 12.01, there's a 911 call that Amy has been impaled with a corn rake. She was telling Carrie how things were tense that day. On that day, the defendant isolates Amy by sending her to the shed. If the defendant wants you to really believe that there is some mystery attacker out there, how would this person know Amy was going to the shed? How? How would they know? Because according to the defendant, it's at that moment that he just says, oh, you know what you can do for me? You can go and get that pet carrier. And not only that, is there somebody waiting there, hoping that there's a murder weapon there? Because he told you that corn rake was in there. So you would have to believe that there's a mystery attacker just standing out there, hoping that somehow Amy gets isolated, and then also hoping, oh wait, I hope there's also a weapon in there so I can kill her. It doesn't make any sense. We know no one else is on the farm. Tristan tells us that and the defendant tells us that. Doesn't hear anything doesn't see anything, never tells the police that there's anybody else, because there's no one else on the farm that day. Because the defendant did this and no one else did it. Also, the defendant tells you he doesn't hear a thing. If you want to believe the defendant's story, let's give him that. Let's, let's, let's for a second say, okay, somebody comes and does this. He wouldn't hear anything with the way Amy fought? With Amy going down like that, getting swung with this corn rake in her back two or three times, the defendant sends Tristan to the shed, sending his 13-year-old son to go and find his mother. He doesn't call 911 right away because he's a doer, and he pulls that rake out of Amy right away. The defendant acts like it's an accident. Think about the defendant's actions, what he did after, telling everybody, implying that this is an accident. He even told you today. Well, yeah, for six days until I, until I was told it was a homicide, I thought it was an accident. Does that make sense? Even, even if he believes that day, fine. Again, let's give him that. That day, he thinks it's an accident because he just can't think of anything else. She must have fallen on a corn rake. The next day when he starts thinking about it and thinks she's face down with a corn rake sticking out of her back, oh, he's still going to think it's an accident? No, because he's hoping that nothing comes of it. But the police and the medical examiners and the doctors, 
realize what actually happened. It wasn't an accident. It was a homicide. The defendant's 911 call. First, listen to the contents of the 911 call. When you hear the defendant first say, oh yeah, I sent my son to the shed. To go, right, I'm sorry, he says, I sent my son to go find my wife. He also tells you she fell on a corn rick. Not, I don't know what happened. I have no idea. He's already telling his story. And I know today you heard some evidence about those whispers on that 911 call. And I'm going to implore you to listen to that 911 call. Don't take my word for it. Don't take the defense attorney's word for it. Because as the judge just told you, what we say is not evidence. Don't believe me. Listen to it for yourself. Make your own determination. That 911 call, there's two parts to it on state's exhibit number two. The first part is about a minute and 30 seconds. The second part is, I think, seven and a half or eight minutes. If you go to that second part and you listen at 6.53, you can hear the defendant whisper, cheating whore. And if you go at 7, 7.00, you can hear, go to hell, cheating whore. Listen to that 911 call. Make the decision for yourselves. And you will know, or you will see that you hear that. Let's also talk about the defendant's actions after. I already started touching on that. But what he starts telling everybody, that this is an accident, about when he speaks with Luke Thompson and John LeClaire, the deputies that day, indicating it's an accident, not telling them anything about the cameras, because now he remembers, well, he thought of it the next day. And the Google searches. I'm not going to go over every single Google search with you, because I know you've heard lots of different evidence. It doesn't matter what time those Google searches are. What matters is the content of them. And yes, I'm sure some of those searches and those records Amy did make, and maybe the kids did too, but you can bet that none of them looked for killing unfaithful women. It just so happens she's having an affair, and, he, and he's not the one looking for killing unfaithful women. Organs of the body. It just so happens that he looks for organs of the body, and four days later she's stabbed in her organs with a corn rake. What happened to cheating spouses in, in ancient historic Aztec tribes? Did ancient, kill, I'm sorry, did ancient cultures kill adulterers? Punishment is 18 months for killing cheating wife. You are, to, you are allowed to consider this because it shows that the defendant is planning this for a very long time. He's thinking about what he's going to do. Now, I know that you're probably wondering, should we believe Tristan? And let's talk about Tristan. He's a 13-year-old boy who will probably never be in a situation like this ever again, I hope, who will never be through or be a part of something so traumatic. He finds his mother with a corn rake sticking out of her back. He yells for his dad. He goes and gets the truck. The defendant puts her bleeding body on top of his as she's unresponsive. He later finds out she died. Think about that. And you know what? You can't blame Tristan, can you? He lost his mom that day. He did, doesn't want to lose his dad either. He's trying to protect his dad. But when you hear, heard the testimony and the different things he said, it makes sense. That day, when he's first interviewed by the police, he says, yep, I'm with dad the whole time. Then when he does a deposition, he says, well, I wasn't with him for like a minute and a half or so. And then right after that deposition, he corrects it and says, well, I don't know how much time. And then when he testifies in court by way of closed circuit TV, again, he will not commit to a time because he doesn't know how much time his dad is out of his sight. He's protecting his dad. And ask yourself, why? Why is his story changing? Why every time is he adding a little bit more time? Do you think he's coming to truth or coming to terms with the truth? The fact that he's accepting that his father killed his mother? He knows nobody else was on that farm that day. Both him and the defendant told you. It's the two of them. 
It's Amy, and it's the kids inside. We have proven the first element that on that date, the defendant committed an act upon Amy Mullis. The second proposition is that Amy Mullis died as a result of the act by the defendant. You heard from both Dr. Thompson and Dr. Cruz. Amy died as a result of her injuries, those six puncture wounds on her body. They entered, I believe she said four of them, um, entered the chest cavity and were fatal. The cause of death was sharp force injuries and the manner of death was homicide. So we have proven that proposition. The third, the defendant acted with malice aforethought. And this is the first state of mind element. And there's a definition that the judge just read to you. Malice state of mind, which leads one to intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of another in disregard of the rights of another out of actual hatred or with an evil or unlawful purpose. Malice may be established by evidence of actual hatred or by proof of a deliberate or fixed intent to do injury, fis fixed purpose or design to do some physical harm to another which exists before the act is committed. It does not have to have, I'm sorry, it does not have to exist for any particular <coughs> length of time. So essentially this state of mind element talks about that it has to have some type of disregard for the rights of another out of actual hatred or with an evil or unlawful purpose. And we have both here. At that point, the defendant does hate Amy. He hates her for cheating on him again, for, uh, for having that affair, for for because she's going to leave him and try to take away the farm. You know this based on everything. Those Google searches in and of themselves show how much hatred he has to her. He's plotting her death, looking up ways to kill her. And even if you look at the second part of that, or with an evil or unlawful purpose, what purpose do you have other than to do some type of intent to do injury when you take this corn rake and you stab someone with it? As that last part says, it doesn't have to exist for any particular length of time. We have proven here that the defendant did plan this, but the, that, that time period, that, that begins the minute the defendant picks up that corn rake and decides to do that act. There's no amount of time that he has to act. We have to actually prove that he planned this. But we know he did. We know it from everything. We know it from all the evidence that you've heard. We know that the defendant acted with malice aforethought based on the injuries. The blunt force trauma on Amy's, uh, the front of her body, and the puncture wounds, which are the sharp force injuries. This attack, this murder, was systematic and deliberate. Think about it. Think about the hatred, the intent to do injury that you must have when you take this and you swing it and st strike somebody, stabbing them in the back. Not once, twice, and possibly three times. The force to which he had to have stabbed her body to go through, to puncture her, um, her breast implant, to go through those organs in that chest cavity. And not only did he stab her with it. He had to take it out and do it again. He is acting with malice aforethought. It does not take that much time to do that. And he was able to do it and get back to the barn to start the cover up. We have proven the third element that the defendant acted with malice aforethought. And the fourth element is that the defendant acted willfully, deliberately, premeditatedly, and with specific intent to kill Amy Mullis. And there's some definitions with regards to this second state of mind element. Willful means intentional or by fixed design or purpose and not accidental. To deliberate is to weigh in one's mind, to consider, to contemplate, or to reflect. Premeditate is to think or ponder upon a matter before acting. Deliberation and premeditation need not exist for any particular length of time before they act. This specific, or I'm sorry, specific intent means not only being aware of doing an act and doing it voluntarily, but in addition, doing it with a specific purpose in mind. This is, def this is generally seldom capable of direct proof, and you have to consider all the facts and evidence surrounding the act to determine the defendant's specific intent. There is no other intent other than to kill when you take this corn rake and you stab somebody with it. 
It's that simple. There's also an inference, a dangerous weapons inference. If a person has the opportunity to deliberate and uses a dangerous weapon against another, resulting in death, you may, but are not required to, infer that the weapon was used with malice, premeditation, and specific intent to kill. That, we've also proven that fourth proposition. Based on all of the evidence, the defendant clearly deliberated, was acting willfully, deliberately, and premeditatedly. We know that. We know he had a specific intent to kill Amy. We know that based on the Google searches. We know that based on the fact that he decided to commit this crime at the exact moment that he did, waiting until she had this simple procedure so he can talk about how dizzy she was, isolating her to the shed, finding a way to get her away from Tristan so that he could commit this act, and then start the cover-up. The defendant's intent was very clear that day. Based on the facts and the evidence and based on the inference, we know that we have proven that fourth proposition. You now know how this nightmare for Amy began. It happened five years ago when the defendant started controlling Amy, making her quit work, making her shop at Goodwill, watching her every move. He was already starting to contemplate after that first affair what he was going to do with her. Those, that, those first Google searches go back to December 25th, 2017, when things, according to the defendant, were going great. They were super open. That first search in 2017 is killing more accepted centuries ago. Then in January 2018, what did ancient cultures do to infidelity? This is even before she starts the affair with Jerry Frazier. Then they go on, January 21st, 2018, 16 facts or characteristics about cheating women. May 10th, 2018, looking at the punishment for a husband that kills the cheating wife. The defendant even was thinking about killing Amy before the second affair. And then it just continued. He continued the searches. He's talking, he's confronting them. He's talking to her friends about, the fa about these rumors. And he wants you to believe that that affair is over. He's not telling you the truth, just like he didn't tell John Turbot the truth that day, when he didn't initially even tell John Turbot about that affair. If he had nothing to hide, why wouldn't he told him? He didn't want to give motive. He didn't want them to think that there's any reason he could have done this. The defendant tried to paint this picture to the police, that things were perfect. He, did the, he tried to do that with you, too. Things were so great. Yet, Amy is terrified for her life. She's telling her friends that she's afraid he's going to kill her, that he might make her disappear. She's making plans to divorce him. She's asking her brother to keep furniture so that she can leave him. Calling Deborah Sherbring, who she barely knows. Deb Sherbring told you she's probably seen Amy once in five years. Calling her hysterical. You've got to stop these rumors. If Todd finds out about them, he's going to kill me. She didn't even know. She starts talking about Tristan. Deb doesn't even know who Tristan is. She's not making this up. That doesn't sound like somebody who's happy in their marriage. That doesn't sound like somebody who's so open with what's going on. Even then, the defendant was planning. It's his cold and calculated plan, like I told you in opening. He started acting like super dad. He all of a sudden got really close to Tristan. He's hanging out with the kids more. All part of his plan. Think about it. This is a big deal. He was going to kill his wife and try to make it look like an accident. He was planning it for months. The Google searches, waiting for her to have this procedure. On November 10th, 2018, the defendant turned their home into a murder scene. The nightmare continued. It didn't just start back when the defendant started these searches or on the day that he killed Amy, because then it continued. The nightmare continued for Amy's family, for her children, for her friends and loved ones. And why? Why did he kill Amy? Because he didn't want to lose his farm? Because she was cheating? You might not like that Amy was having an affair, but that doesn't mean she deserved to die. And does the defendant think he gets to decide who lives and dies? 
Does he think he's above the law? He thinks the laws in Iowa don't apply to him? Today's the day you tell him the laws in the state of Iowa do apply to the defendant. Tell him he's not above the law. The defendant thought he silenced Amy's voice on November 10th, 2018. But this week, Amy's voice was heard here in this courtroom. Through the witnesses, through the evidence, Amy's voice was screaming through this courtroom this week, showing you that the defendant did this, pointing all the evidence towards the defendant, showing you he committed this brutal, senseless, and vicious murder. Tonight, today, this nightmare finally ends. It finally ends for Amy and for her friends and family, for her children, because Amy finally gets the justice she deserves. Today is the day you find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. Thank you.